Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good to see you all out on this cool winter evening. Hope you had a good day in the Lord on this Sunday in January, the second Sunday in January of 2018. Whew. Can't believe we are almost halfway through the month of January already. First month of the year. It's getting time to seems to be flying by. Um, turn with me in your Bibles to the New Testament book of Colossians, uh, chapter 4, the last chapter in Colossians. We're going to be reading verses 2 through 6 and then 12 through 13. So if you would and can stand once you've found it, that's Colossians 4, 2 through 6, and then uh, 12 through 13. <clears throat> Colossians 4, 2 through, 2 through 6, and then 12 through 13. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, Season with salt, so that you may know how to answer, answer everyone. In verse 12 and 13. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I, I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Heropolis. Would you bow your heads, please? Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for speaking to us this evening through it. Bless your words to our hearts. Encourage us and strengthen us. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We are in the middle of winter, but the days are starting to get longer already. We're starting to head towards springtime. So actually, I'm going to be talking about a subject that kind of deals with springtime. Praise God. Yeah, springtime. <laughs> I, I can't wait for warmer weather, that's for sure. I love warmer weather. Spring was planting time on the little farm. Most of you who have either had a farm or a garden or whatever know that. Spring was planting time. The old farmer would hitch up Betsy and Jack. No, those weren't his kids. Those were his mules. And they would start plowing the hard ground. The farmer and his team of mules turned up the dirt, broke up the big dirt clods, turned up the rocks, and then smoothed out the broken soil. Then came the seeding, and then the waiting, and the waiting. At that point, it was up to God. He brought the weather, the warmth, the moisture, and the sunlight. Then, when the corn finally matured, the farmer swung into action once again with the work of harvesting what God had grown. It really is a neat balance, you see, of what a man can do and what only God can do. His hand and yours would be my sermon for you this evening. His hand and yours. One of the spiritual giants of the first century church at Colossus was a man named Epaphras. Some Bible scholars think he was the man who actually started the church that Paul wrote to in his letter to the Colossians. At the time Paul wrote, Epaphras was actually traveling with Paul. That's why he sent his greetings. And like a good spiritual farmer, he understood that wonderful balance between God's work and man's work. Our scripture focus for this evening from God's Word begins in Colossians 4.12 where Paul writes, Epaphras, who is one of you, and a servant of Christ Jesus sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you. Now there is a man who practiced the dynamic duo of praying hard and working hard. That was Epaphras. When Paul says Epaphras was wrestling in prayer, Maybe some of you have used that term. Have you ever wrestled in prayer? He's actually using the Greek word here, agonizomai, which is the word where we get the word 
agonize, okay? When this man prayed for people he loved, it wasn't just some short little casual, dear God, please bless them and help them. No, he was like a wrestler, using everything he had to win the battle for these people. He was in spiritual battle for his friends, his loved ones, praying with total intensity and passion, agonizing in prayer for his loved ones. He was seeking God for things only God could do in their lives, like empowering them to live right, to choose God's will, to grow up and mature. Like the old farmer I talked about earlier, he was totally trusting God for the crop to come up. He was. But he also believed in working hard for those very same people. Again, like the old farmer, he knew there were some things that he was supposed to do in the process. And Paul said he was working very hard on the part that was his, the things he was to do. Now, in spiritual farming, you're doing raising your family. Raising your family, that's a huge part of your spiritual farming because your children are the crop that you are growing. They're the ones you are praying over, that you're agonizing over, that you're trying to raise right. Doing your ministry, that's wherever you walk, talk, go. Wherever you are, you are being a minister of God to other people. Um, or maybe you're developing people, discipling people in the church, or maybe in a Bible study or in your home, developing people. It's important that you, though, do both, okay? We all must do both. We must pray very hard for what only God can do and work very hard on the things that He requires of us to do. We must do both. Now, the problem is many of us tend to naturally gravitate to one or the other of these two and not naturally to both. And then neglect the one that you don't gravitate towards. We often work hard, but then don't often pray enough. Or we pray hard, but then don't work enough. That is the, that's the normal for most people. It's just a tendency. Whatever tendency you go towards, if you like to spend a lot of time in prayer, you sometimes neglect the working hard part, or the opposite. Now, the old farmer couldn't make that crop come up or grow, could he? The old farmer couldn't do any of that. He had to totally trust God for God's part. But God didn't do what? God didn't turn up the ground. God didn't plant the seed for him. God also didn't harvest the crop. He expected the farmer to do that which what he could do. And God expects each one of us to do that which you and I can do. There's no sitting on the bench. We are to be bench warmers in, in God's house. I mean, we do come and sit on the pews, but we are to be workers. We are to be working hand in hand, one with another, in the harvest, the field for God. We are to be working hard, not just praying, but also working. Now, many of the great miracles of the Bible are like that, right? If you look at them. Let's look at a few here, just for a second. How about the wedding servants getting the water and pouring them from the pots, or into the pots, and then only Jesus could turn the water into wine. Think about that for a second. Those disciples could have just said, ah, just create it out of thin air, or, or ah, you're crazy. But Jesus asked them to do something, and they did the work. They went and carried the water and poured it into the pots, just as he asked them to do. And then Jesus did what they could not do, which was the miracle. How about the disciples? The disciples could find lunch, get people seated, and prepare to serve them. But only Jesus can make one small boy's lunch enough for everybody to have their fill. Mm -hmm. Amen. Think about that for a second. You know, the disciples did their part. They could all wave back and say, Jesus, just make it happen. Because Jesus could have made it happen. Mm -hmm. But he required them to have faith and sit everybody. You, know, you could just see the disciples, right? They knew all they had was this one boy's lunch, the few loaves and fishes, right? And Jesus said, have everybody sit down. Just think of the disciples going, wait a second. All we have is this. This isn't going to go very far, Jesus. And, and then the next thought could be, well, if you're going to feed him, Jesus, you just do it all. But no. Jesus had them have the crowd sit down and prepare to eat. He, got, they, he told the disciples to get them ready. 
But then it was Jesus that did the miracle and took a small boy's lunch and fed the thousands from this one, one small boy's lunch. Always that, there's always that beautiful balance of God's hand doing what he only, can, only he can do and your hand being required to do what God asks you and I to do. So, this evening, I pose this question to all of us. What part is God expecting you and I to do in our daily lives? What part is it? Because we know that God is faithful, and He will do His part. But what is it that He is asking you and I to do? Well, to find that out, the first thing we must do is get on our knees and pray and ask Him. We need to ask Him for direction. Ask Him for guidance. Ask Him to show us and tell us what He wants us to do. Now, there are many situations where it is obvious what God would have us to do. Sometimes, especially in a church setting. But, again, there are times that we don't know what to do. But too often times we just run around doing things just to try to make things happen. When we should be waiting upon God, asking Him for direction and guidance, and then following what He would have us to do. Don't decide, and here's the problem with just running around trying to make things happen. Too many of us, we get ahead of God. Okay? God has a plan, and He has a timeline, and often we get ahead of God, and guess what? When we do things our way, we mess them up. But I guarantee if you do it God's way every time, it'll be just right, and it'll work out just as God designed it to work out every time. Now, when you get in a situation, you're looking for God's guidance. Be serious about it. Sincerely look for God's guidance. Don't just decide... Uh, what you're supposed to do based on the situation or the crisis or what the conventional wisdom is around you. How many times in God's Word do we see men, of, men and women of God doing things that went completely against conventional wisdom because God asked them to do? How about Joshua and Jericho? Their military plan to go around the city and march and sing and play instruments like they did was not the conventional military wisdom. It went against everything that military wisdom would tell you to do. But all they were to do was to be faithful and trust God and do what He asked them to do. And then He did what they couldn't do. He knocked the walls down and they completely took over the city. So that, again, don't, don't rely upon conventional wisdom because conventional wisdom is not always God's wisdom. It's not always God's way. So in this, ask God to lead you into efforts He wants you to do. We should always ask God for that. Because it won't be your or my efforts that will bring about the results anyway. It will always be God's efforts. God will do the things that only He can do. Now, but strangely, it might not happen or at least be hindered if you and I don't do what He wants you to do. Think about that for a second. God can do anything. But if we reject God's wisdom, if we decide, ah, I don't want to do that, God, if we decide that we know best and we don't do as God would have us to do, we can actually stop things that God wants to happen or at least hinder them. And when that happens, things really get messed up. People that are supposed to find God don't find God. Things that God wished to happen don't happen because we get in the way and we refuse to follow God and His will in His way. Always trust God. Always seek God's guidance in prayer, in His Word. If you don't know where to turn to, if you don't know what to do, seek it out in God's Word. I guarantee you, He will show you something to at least get you started in the right direction. Now, there are many things in today's society and life that we may face that, that were not addressed in God's Word because they didn't have computers or cell phones or whatever. But basic principles to any question, to any issue you have to deal with are always found in God's Word. And again, if you seek Him out in His will and way, He will use God's Word to direct you in the right path to go. To have you go where He wants you to go and do the things He would have you to do every time. You can trust God, and you can trust His Word. And the opposite is true. If you, the direction you're planning on going somehow 
uh, it contradicts God's word and goes against God's word, I can guarantee you're going in the wrong direction every time. Every time. So pray very hard. Again, I can't underestimate the importance of praying hard. Too often we pray about something and leave it go. We, we, people used to pray through on things. You remember that? You used to hear that phrase? Praying through on things. Just constantly praying until you hear God's answer. You know God's answer. So again, start by praying very hard. Then, after you've prayed hard, work very hard at what God has, has you to do. Whatever that is. That's always the blueprint. That's always the formula for a wonderful harvest in God's kingdom. Every time. In the words of the first foreign missionary in modern times, William Carey, see if you remember this, pray as if it all depends upon God, because it does, and work as if it all depends upon you, because God wants you to work. Never forget, faith without works is what? Dead. Faith without works is dead. But a vibrant soul full of faith will give their best to the work of the kingdom of God every time. Every time. Please stand and we're going to close in prayer. Jeff, would you close in prayer, please?